after that battle, Nasrallah, Sayyid Nasrallah, the head of the Hezbollah, he gave a famous speech. And he said about Bin Chabil, he said, it shows that Israel is a spider's web. And they said, you just blow on it, and it disappears. After October 7, he gave another speech, and he said, October 7 showed to many people that I was right. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 192. And this episode is with Norman Finkelstein, who is an historian and political scientist that received his PhD from the Princeton University Politics Department. And Norman is best known for his absolutely impeccable research on Israel and Palestine, which is precisely why he is the perfect guest to mark the end of this three-part installment on the conflict. The first episode in this little series was with Richard Wolff, where we talked all about his Marxist perspective on the situation. And then the second, the most recent episode, was with Victor Davis Hanson on his conservative and military history-based analysis. But this episode, if it centers on anything, it centers on Norman's impeccable research that I've just mentioned, and then his focus on justice. So more particularly, we discuss the importance or distraction of ideology, whether Israel is ethnically cleansing Palestine, the message that Israel's intelligence disaster of October 7th sent to the Arab world and, and the world at large, what Gaza has in common with the concentration camps of the Holocaust, which is a, a very uh, contentious comparison to be drawing at all, uh, Palestinian and Arab psychology, uh, whether this, is, this conflict is going to be the end of humanity, and more. Uh, anyway, it's a great episode. Norman is terrific. So you should leave comments, reviews, uh, you should subscribe if you haven't. And then there is also a Patreon, the link to which is in the description for ad-free listening, show notes, and just general support of the show. So without any further ado, I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it. I've had a, a number of conversations on the show at this point about Israel and Palestine and read a number of books too from various perspectives, a, a couple of which are yours. And one perspective I often hear from the Zionist side is that the conflict we label as Israel-Palestine is really Israel versus the entire Arab world, that this is demonstrated by events like the Arab-Israeli War of 1948 and uh, and this is a phrase I often hear. Uh, it's really just David versus Goliath, where Israel is David. And what I wanted to start off by asking is whether you think that this is really the, the best way to view the two sides of the conflict. I think that it's important to clarify terminology, even though people might think it's picayune. Uh, I do believe that the terminology used can, I hate these postmodern expressions, but can frame a conversation in such a way, in such a way as for it to be misleading. So we should begin with the terminology. Number one, with some exceptions, I'm not going to deny there's an aspect to it that's valid. I don't think calling this a Zionist perspective has much of value. Zionism is an ideology, and residues of that ideology, and really some components, I'm not going to deny that, uh, do determine Israeli policy and do determine the support of Israel. But in general, I think um, it's probably more valid to speak about just Israeli state policy or uh, what the Palestinians aspire to, 
and not affix any labels. I don't like the label pro-Israeli and pro-Palestinian. I'm kind of old-fashioned. I believe in pro-truth, pro-justice, anti-truth, anti-justice. Those labels make sense for me. But pro-Zion, actually Zionist or pro-Israel, uh, I don't see, you know, not to anticipate too much of this conversation, but I do feel that Israel is moving towards an existential, for the first time, for the first time, Israel is facing an existential threat. Uh, and I can't see how it can be pro-Israel to keep pushing it in a direction that might result in its extinction. So the term pro-Israel, within that context, doesn't make sense to me. That if by pro-Israel you mean pro the government policy, which is driving it in a direction which, in my view, for the first time in the history of the conflict, might be existential, doesn't make any sense to me. And in the same way, terms like being pro-Zionist doesn't make much sense to me. First of all, the term Zionism is so vague and so uh, embracing that you have a person like Benjamin Netanyahu and a person like Noam Chomsky both calling themselves Zionists. Well, if that term is so capacious as to embrace, on one end of the spectrum, Benjamin Netanyahu, and at the other end of the spectrum, Noam Chomsky, it can be very illuminating. A term that it's so embracing can be very illuminating. So uh, I, I think as a point of departure for our conversation, uh, it's useful to discard those sorts of labels and just point to what are the aims to the extent that they can be discerned what are the objectives to the extent that they can be discerned? And what are the aspirations to the extent that they can be discerned? That, to me, is a much more sensible way to move forward. I appreciate two things that you just did. One, I really appreciate your <laughs> correcting, well, maybe not correcting, but your input on the way that I was framing things. And also this distinction that you made between Zionism, pro-Israel, pro-Palestine, these sorts of terms on the one side, and then being pro-truth or pro-justice on the other. Because before we were, before we started recording, I mentioned that I was speaking to one of my professors at, at, at Stanford about you yesterday. And he had sent me a couple of your books, which I read. And my impression was that you were, I wanted to label you pro-Palestine. And he told me, no, he's not pro-Palestine. That is what people will say. But in fact, he comes in without any predispositions and is just an impeccable researcher. Apparently, he was on the board of the review board for one of your books at University of California Press. And for whatever reason, whatever the politics were, they really went over your book uh, with, I don't know what the phrase is, fine, fine comb, but they could... A fine tooth comb. Fine tooth comb. They could not find a single problem with this very lengthy manuscript. And he said, you're not pro-Palestinian. You're pro-truth and just an impeccable researcher. You will very rarely find an error. First of all, because I'm very exacting. And second of all, because I hire people to fact check at my own expense. I don't want errors. I don't want errors because for me, a book is like a painting. And if you have a masterpiece and then somebody mars one quarter, you know, puts a thumbprint, it destroys, you know, it destroys the book. Uh, it destroys the painting. And I feel the same way in my last book, the Gaza book, <laughs> the last main, well, no, actually I've written several books, but the main pertinent book right, right now is Gaza, an inquest into its martyrdom. There is one error. It doesn't change anything, but it's still a numerical error. And I really wanted my publisher to correct it, 
they were unable to correct it uh, <clears throat> for reasons having to do with expense. And every time I opened that book, because I had to reread it when October 7th happened, I'm always pained and anguished that that error is there. It's like almost, it's almost anal retentive with me at this point. Uh, you won't find the errors. <laughs> I'm very confident of that. Um, very careful. But on the other hand, I was, I was my political self long before I discovered Israel-Palestine. I was engaged politically from age, you would say, 15 or 16, or maybe even younger, because I came from such a politicized home. All we talked about was politics. Uh, so from a very young age, I was pol a political being, uh, maybe not in the Aristotelian sense, but in the sense of engaged constantly with the issues of the day. Um, so long before Palestine was on my radar, I was involved in the war of Vietnam, the civil rights movement, the uh, uh, wars in Central America. Uh, you could say I'm on the side of the oppressed. That's true. That would be true. But I never saw that as a contradiction with being on the side of truth. Because, as a, you know, you're a young man, so you don't know the radical tradition. But it was always a hallmark of the radical tradition in its classical form that, to use the expression of Antonio Gramsci, the truth is revolutionary, which is to say there's no contradiction between pursuing truth, pursuing justice, and being on the side of the oppressed. There wasn't a conflict there. The truth is revolutionary. So Palestine happened to have been uh, at a point in my life in June 1982. It fell, on my, or fell above my radar. <clears throat> and um, the only reason I stuck to it was not because I'm pro-Palestine or I have some sort of obsession or fetish with Palestine, Palestinians, Arabs, Islam. No, the conflict just didn't go away. It just went on and on and on and on. And I'm not a quitter. I'm not a fair weather friend. Um, so I stuck to it. It had nothing to do with Palestine. Uh, that is, uh, it's, it's just not a part of my mental calculus. Hmm. Well, maybe we sh I should reframe that initial question I started out with avoiding uh, terms like Zionism and maybe being more explicit. The person that I have in mind from which this question arises is, arises is Noah Tishby, who, of course, is not a historian like you, but that was one of the main books I read uh, that is in defense of Israel today, largely speaking. And she casts the situation as, I don't know if she uses the phrase David versus Goliath, but she definitely references that Arab-Israeli war of 1948 quite often, as well as what you describe. She doesn't put it in the, because she doesn't think that they're myths, but you reference three myths connected to the conquering of Palestine, uh, purity of arms, uh, whether or not the, the territory was in fact deserted. This goes back to your takedown of, uh, from time immemorial, and then whether or not it was a war of self-defense. And that is where, of course, the Arab-Israeli War of 1948 comes in. But So I'm wondering if you still think it's reasonable to begin by, I mean, we're, we're past our beginning, but to clarify what the sides of this conflict are, maybe historically, and, and today? Historically, it's clear, I think it's clear to say that the Zionist movement recognized so early on that there was a problem, namely the land was not empty. And in fact, it was not only not empty, Palestine or what they call the land of Israel, it was not only not empty, it was coveted by most of the great powers. It was coveted at the beginning of the 20th century by the Germans, by the British, by the Turks, uh, 
many, for various reasons, the great powers uh, coveted Palestine. So the Zionist movement resolved from early on that both because there was already an indigenous population and because the great powers coveted it, that there was no way to achieve the Zionist goal of creating a Jewish state in Palestine. There was no way to do it without the support of a great power. And in that era and thereafter, being supported by a great power, in effect, meant being supported by one of the imperialist powers. That was just the name of the game. So, uh, from the beginning, Zionism was perceived as an arm of uh, Western imperialism, Western colonialism, and I would say uh, with uh, validity. Now, the fact that it began that way doesn't mean it had to end that way. <laughs> but already, if you look at the statements of people like David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, and he was also basically the leader of the what was called the Yeshiv, the Jewish community in Palestine. They were convinced that the Arab Muslim world would never accept it, that they were a foreign implant. They recognized that, even though they believed they were a foreign implant because they claimed a biblical right to the land, but they recognized it would be perceived as a foreign implant. And therefore, David Ben-Gurion, from very early on, he said that we always need the backing of a great power. We always need some great power to buttress our claim to the land. Now, that great power obviously became, beginning in 1917, it became the British with the Balfour Declaration. By 1947, for reasons which shouldn't uh, distract us, the British had soured of what was called the Palestine Mandate, another term which would require explanation. I'm simply going to use it. Those of you listeners who understand it, good. And if not, we can move on. Uh, they soured in the Palestine Mandate, and um, it was thrown into the court of the newly born United Nations, and after the uh, World War II, uh, both the Soviet Union and the United States, quite remarkably, because the Cold War had already begun, both of them, for various reasons, uh, support the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine. A war began. Uh, the um, scholarly literature, uh, it will take me, I will just refer to it, and then your listeners who are interested can go check for themselves. The best study that's been done on the topic is a fellow named Ze'ev Ma'oz. It's called Defending the Holy Land in which he goes through all the wars Israel has fought since 1948. <clears throat> and he says his conclusion, it's a hefty volume, uh, exhaustively researched, mostly on the basis of secondary sources, with one shop there, I would say, uh, based on primary research. But he comes to the conclusion, and I'll quote him. I don't have the exact words in front of me. I could find them. Exp uh, expeditiously, if you like, but he says, with the possible exception of 1948, with the possible exception of 1948, that first Arab-Israeli war, none of the wars Israel fought, fought were wars without choice. Those were wars Israel chose to fight. 56, 67, 73, 82, uh, and onward. Those were not existential threats to Israel. They were not wars. The expression uh, in Israel is Ein Brera, E-I-N-B-R-E-R-A, meaning no choice. Ein Brera. And he says, no, that's not true exhaustively going through all the available scholarship. He says, with the possible exception, 1948 is a 
cloudy question uh, because it seems that most of the powers that intervened, namely Jordan, Egypt, they intervened not to destroy Israel, but to, it was basically a land grab to take for themselves a chunk of the land that had been allocated for Israel in the, in the 1947 UN resolution. That's simplifying a complicated picture, but I think it's an accurate simplification. That's why uh, Ze'ev Ma'oz says, with the possible exception, because uh, it wasn't as if Israel's existence was at stake, uh, not because any of the Arab states had any, there was any love lost between them and Israel, but most of the Arab states had, they didn't have armies. They had palace, uh, what's the expression, a palace, uh, like uh, something sharply reduced from an army, a palace. Well, uh, just troops to protect the king. They weren't capable of aggressive uh of aggressive war belligerencies. Um, so I think that's the basic picture. For the, uh, I could say 48 is a slightly more ambiguous case, but none of the other cases have an, any ambiguity. Those were wars Israel chose to for, fight for various reasons. Hmm. Well, I think that there are two directions in which we could go from this well, point. Sure, one, to just add one last thing, because please, would that be you say about Israel's relationship to the Arab world, uh, and whether it's hostile, whether it's amenable to resol amenable to a peaceful diplomatic settlement? There can't be any question, in my opinion, since two thousand two, what's called the Arab Peace Initiative. Since two thousand two. Uh, all the Arab states, all the members of the Arab, what, were, what was called back then the Arab League, I'm not sure if they maintain the same name, I, I think they maybe have, uh, all the members of the Arab League, and then there's another separate organization, which is the Conference of uh, Islamic States, uh, which is, I think, 57 countries. Um, both of those are completely on board with a two-state settlement on the June 1967 border. So whatever you want to say about the past, uh, I think it's clear from the beginning of the, of the 21st century, from 2002, uh, and the Arab Peace Initiative, and then it being adopted by the Confederation of Islamic States, um, that a a reasonable solution is certainly has certainly been within reach for more than two decades. Israel just rejected it. Hmm. Well, when I I said a moment ago there are, are two directions in which we could go, what uh, now that now you've brought three onto the table, I think one though there there are obviously plenty more. One would be returning to that historical. Zionist movement and leading, leaving president, present ideology aside and determining or exploring whether the motives behind Zionism hold water, uh, such as, I mean, divine right, if that presumably, I don't know, your religious background, maybe that's one that, that doesn't hold water. Another is looking at the refugee crisis and how it might have emerged. 1947 with that UN resolution and 1948 with the war we were just discussing, because I think that's pretty practical for or important for what's happening going on today. And then the third direction that you just brought on the table is the peace process. But maybe we should stick with the second of those three options for now. So I understand that there's a lot of historical debate about where the onus of responsibility lies regarding the refugee crisis. You talk a lot about Benny Morris's uh, work here, but maybe we should start with the historical picture here around 1947 and 1948 and 
how that has led to the refugee crisis that persists today? Well, the Zionist movement, its aim, at the beginning, the aims were, uh, they, there was a range. But I would say by the time of the, uh, what were called the, the, what was called the Arab Revolt in 1936 to 1939, and then another part of the world, the Nazi Holocaust, the combined effect of those two events was the Zionist movement resolved to create a Jewish state in Palestine. And a Jewish state in Palestine meant something pretty, pretty clear. It meant, number one, a Jewish majority, uh, a state that would be, which would belong to the Jews. And the, the index of whether or not it belonged to the Jews was whether Palestine had a Jewish majority, whether the state had a Jewish majority. And that posed two problems, and those are basic, very, very basic problems. Problem number one, Palestine was overwhelmingly not Jewish in 1947. It was roughly 600,000 Jews living there and about 1 million, 200,000 or 300,000, I can't remember, uh, pa uh, Arabs, at that point, Palestinian Arabs living there. And then there was a second fundamental problem. The second fundamental problem was land. You can very well create a Jewish state if you don't own any of the land, or just a marginal portion of the land. And so, um, in order to create what was called a stable Jewish majority, that's the term they use, stable Jewish majority, the view was that the minority, the non-Jewish minority, had to be no more than 15 to 20 percent of the population. Once it exceeded 15 to 20 percent, then this Jewish majority, which was the sine qua non of a Jewish state, uh, it would be in jeopardy. At least that was the view. So even in the state that was carved out by the UN, and it was a very strange state. It's usually called a state of interlocking serpents because it's something like this, the state, if you can imagine it. So they called it interlocking serpents uh, because they had to carve it out in such a way that Jews would be a majority, uh, even though an infinitesimal majority, it's not going to be that stable Jewish majority. So, and even in that state, Jews owned practically none of the land. Because early on, the Arab national movement declared it an act of treason to sell land to this movement that wants to dispossess them, which is a perfectly sensible goal to, to say, when don't sell the land, and you better not sell the land because uh, these people are acquiring the land plot by plot, acre by acre, dunum by dunum, in order to create a foundation to dispossess us. So, uh, Benny Morris, in his not the version I, I address in the book, uh, he has an expanded version of his. Uh, examination of the refugee question. And if you look at that expanded version, he says, and I'm quoting him now, the idea of transfer, transfer was the euphemism they used back then for expulsion. The idea of transfer was inbuilt and inevitable in Zionism. Now those are his words, inbuilt and inevitable in Zionism. That is to say, you couldn't create a Jewish state without uh, expelling a large part of the indigenous population. So that's one aspect. You can call that the theoretical aspect. And then there's the practical aspect. And the practical aspect is that you know the expression, the French expression, I'll say it in English, when in war, do as in war. 
which is just a fancy French way. I loathe the French, so everything <laughs> makes me ill. But that's just a fancy way of saying that you can get away with things in wartime that you can't get away in peacetime. And Ben-Gurion was very conscious of that possibility. So very similar now, because uh, I'll just allude to the present, but Back then, the problem was how to create a Jewish state with an overwhelmingly non-Jewish population, and that non-Jewish population owns the land. Well, comes the war, here's our opportunity to overcome, surmount that the barrier. How do you surmount it? Well, that's pretty straightforward. You simply empty the land of the people so you no longer have a demographic problem and you no longer have a territorial problem. And then the territorial in the sense of uh, acreage on which you can create a Jewish state. And that's basically what's happening right now. Right now there is a recognition that after October 7th, we have another one in war, do I was in war, in order to overcome another problem. And the problem that's always been a thorn at the side of Israel has been the problem of Gaza. And Gaza has historically resisted in, in a uh, robust way Israeli attempts to subjugate it. And it was, they've tried many things, Israel, and they turned it into a concentration camp. Then they tried to buy off the leadership, hoping they can do with Hamas what they did with the Palestinian Liberation Organization when they create the Palestine Authority, Palestinian Authority, maybe we can buy them off. Uh, and none of those strategies, if uh, it turns out, as of October 7th, work. And so now Israel is facing another dilemma, and it's when in war, do as in war. And so right now it's on the spectrum between on one end attempting ethnic cleansing, what it did in 1948, uh, and on the other hand, simply wiping out the population, uh, what Netanyahu calls this is a war against Amalek, which means you kill every man, woman, and child. And then the middle term of that spectrum, we have uh, ethnic cleansing at one end, uh, extermination at the other end, the middle term is to make Gaza unlivable you know, so that when the dust has settled and your eyes are opened, there is nothing there. And that's already, that's already been achieved in what's in the northern half of Gaza. Uh, the uh, Financial Times a few days ago had this visual of northern Gaza, and they said it's true. Northern Gaza, there's nothing there anymore. It's gone. They vaporized northern Gaza. <coughs> so, and that's basically, by the way, uh, you know, the expression, nothing, everything old is, everything new is old again, where everything old is new again. I can't remember how it goes. Uh, that's what they did in 1948. They expelled the population and then they flattened 450 villages. They just disappeared. They were vaporized. Obviously not with the kind of efficiency that's available currently to Israel, uh, but that's what they did. Uh, <clears throat> so in the course of that ethnic cleansing, uh, we'd have to call it an ethnic cleansing plus because Israel wanted to make sure they could never go back. And that's why it flattened. The estimate is about 450 villages. Um, so. Um, that created the Palestine, what's called the Palestinian refugee question. About 750,000, yeah, 750,000 Palestinians were expelled. Uh, a large number of them, about 300,000, they were expelled to Gaza. And, um, you know, some people say, well, it wasn't actually an expulsion. It was, uh, it was people fleeing war. Uh, I don't really think that's true. I, I don't want to go into the nitty-gritty, but we knew it, 
exactly what Benny Morris said. The idea of exp um, expulsion was built in and inevitable in Zionism. We also knew the Zionist leaders realized there's a war, and in war, do as in war. We had an opportunity. Now, when the opportunity availed itself, we didn't need an order from above. Everybody knew what needed to be done. We have a chance, get rid of them, and they have no compunction about it. You know, they were, uh, by, uh, you could say there were some decent elements within the Zionist movement. There were. I will never deny that. Uh, but by 1947, at, after the Nazi Holocaust, the feeling was, we're, we're taking ourselves a state, come what may. And nobody's going to get into our, get in our way. Men were pretty ruthless. Um, to some extent, you can understand the ruthlessness, but uh, <clears throat> only to some extent. Uh, but I, I, I can get it. I can get it. I can understand it. Uh, and the same thing is now. It's a combination of uh, right now. It's a, right now speaking for today. It's a combination of revenge, the bloodlust for you know after October seven. Um, then there's another factor which is Israel feels that its weakness was revealed to the Arab world because it was such a catastrophic intelligence failure on October 7th. And Israel has always, its brand has always been its intelligence, the Mossad, and the commando raids, and its, you know, cutting-edge surveillance technology. And on October 7th, it was a complete and total catastrophe. This ragtag, it's not even a guerrilla army, this ragtag, uh, I don't even know what to call them, in a concentration camp, managed to outwit, outsmart this whole, you know, Israelis, those commandos, those James Bonds. So there was a real need for Israel, beyond just the sheer bloodlust, to restore what Israel calls its deterrence capacity, namely the Arab world's fear of it. And there was a legitimate concern there. I have to acknowledge, I have to be faithful to facts and faithful to truth. There is a legitimate concern that now portions of the Arab world perceive Israel as being much weaker much more vulnerable than they had hitherto imagined. October 7th shattered the image of the invincible Israel, and suddenly it dawned on a large number of people that there is a military option against Israel. There is a military option. So then, beyond the bloodlust and the anger, the anger that these Arabs, these untermenschen, these subhumans, had dared to raise their heads, had dared to outsmart us. You know, it was the same reaction of the Nazis to the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. They were so incensed so inflamed, these Jews resisting. And what did they do? They went in, they flattened Warsaw. They flattened Warsaw. So there is that element, and I don't want to deny it, the, what I would call bloodlust, um, but also the anger at the, <clears throat> the anger of the Ubermenschen against these Ultramensions who had raised their heads. But there is also, I do believe there is, that's why I said, I don't think it's very pro-Israel now to egg it on, to urge it on this path, because the Arab world or portions of the Arab world have now become convinced that there is 
a military option. Namely, Israel is not the invincible state that people imagined it to me. Just yesterday, I was reading an article, you know, I think it was Haaretz, but don't quote me on it. I think it was, or another periodical, by a fellow named Chaim, C-H-A-I-M, Levinson, L-E-V-I-N-S-O-I. I think he sometimes writes for the Times, because I've noticed his byline. I assume, but I could be wrong, it's the same person. And he said, well, we always brag about, he's Israeli, we always brag about our army being the strongest in the world, we are the toughest in the world. And then I was surprised. He said, in fact, we have a very mediocre army. It's the truth. I, I knew that. Israel, uh, uh, the head of um, Hezbollah, Syed Nasrallah, he said in one of his post-October 7 speeches, he says, the only thing Israel is capable of is carrying out massacres. And that's true. Israel can only carry out high-tech massacres. It does not have a fighting force anymore. I don't particularly blame them. They're like, you, you're a young man, you have a beautiful home. No, it's true. You're a young man, you have a beautiful home, you're attending Standard Univers Stanford University, you have a whole future ahead of you. You are assumed from comments you made in passing, you're secular uh, in your uh, mental orientation. Do you want to die in a war? No, not really. No. And that's most Israelis. Now, they're willing to go in after Israel has demolished everything, you know, like now they're in the north, a part of Gaza. Israel has pretty much demolished everything. They go in, wreck everything. And so, yes, some of them are going to die, but not many. I think the current number is 168 Israelis. And I think that number includes the number who were killed on October 7th, combatants who were killed, when they, uh, people who are technically military people, when the uh, outbreak from um, uh, Gaza occurred. So they're not a fighting force because they don't want to die. They don't. On the other side, well, first of all, there's a, it can't come as a surprise that young men born in a concentration camp and who had no future except to die in that concentration camp, that they were willing to die. That doesn't come as a shock to me. If you grow up, you're born in Gaza, the concentration camp, the expression concentration camp to describe Gaza was already in 2004 by Israel's uh, head of uh, the National Security Council, Guerra Island. You, your listeners can check for themselves. They just have to Google G-I-O-R-A, Giora Island, E-I-L-A-N-D, and then put in March 2004. Already, he back then was describing Gaza as, I'm calling him, a huge concentration camp. Now, bear in mind, that's about, roughly, it's about 20 years ago. Most of the people who burst the gates of Gaza on October 7th, they were young men. They had been born in a concentration camp. And as of October 7th, they didn't see any future. You know, they just saw, like our Nat Turner, the slave in 1831. He was a very bright young man. He happened to have been very religious, like Hamas, extremely religious guy, fanatic, you could say. Fair, it's fair enough. I, I think just the, the religion is just an express, a way to express who you are. You're using maybe a, uh, 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 a religious language, but it's a normal human aspiration. Uh, Matt Turner was an extremely smart guy. Every white person, every black person who met him said, this guy is very, very smart. He was highly literate, highly literate. And he faced the prospect, here I am, a very smart guy, and but for the grace of God, I could have had a beautiful life. I was born black. I'm going to be a slave the rest of my life. You know, when that dawns on you, when that dawns on you that you have every right to experience life's happiness or at least to aspire to experience it and 
you have every right as anybody else, and it's denied to you because of this fluke that you were born black, or you were born in a concentration camp. So it can't altogether surprise that these people are going to do anything and everything, and they don't worry at all about their life, because there is no life. There is no life. Just like the slave could see white life going on normally. There's the weddings, there are the parties, there are the concerts. A person in Gaza could see that on the web. And they're thinking, why me? What godforsaken thing has befallen me? And so they were they were ready and they were ready to die. You know? See, and then on the other side is and there's another swath of people who are not secular, but for a large number of reasons they hate Israel. And that's the people in Hezbollah. They experienced the wars with Israel. You know, 1982, Israel invaded Lebanon killed between 15 and 20,000 people, overwhelmingly civilians. The first time that number was exceeded, by the way, is now with the war in Gaza. It's not war, it's a genocide in Gaza. Uh, that's the first time that number from 82 was exceeded. And then Israel occupied Lebanon from 1983 to 2000, really from 1978 to 2000, but we'll do it from after the first Lebanon war. And it had a murderous, uh, they called it an, a Gestapo-like torture chamber in Kian. Uh, it was called Kian Prison, in uh, K-H-I-A-M, for your listeners, they can Google it, uh, in South Lebanon. Um, so those people are filled with such anger and rage, and they believe they have religion on their side. Does that make them religious fanatics, you know, like these lunatics like Sam Harris like to say these people are all crazy, jihadis, blah, 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 blah. You know, every movement has its, what you might call, its sense of inevitability and hope. I was for the longest part of my life. I don't disclaim it, but I don't boast, I don't proclaim it either. So I belong to the whole Marxist tradition. And the whole Marxist tradition was resolutely secular, resolutely secular, but it believed that the forces of history were on its side, that history was moving in its direction. <laughs> That's not much different than a religious belief. Now, I recognize that Marxists will say it's grounded in secular facts. But the sense of you have history on your side is, I think, common to both religious and secular political movements. Now, we take Martin Luther King. He says the arc of, uh, um, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. Now, admittedly, Martin Luther King was a religious person, uh, but that's also a secular belief. It's also a secular belief. Look, the secular belief, the old Enlightenment view of progress. Uh, the overall, you know, Professor Chomsky, who was a uh, was a secularist for, for sure, he would ne he never rejected the Enlightenment view. He would say, well, if you look back. He says, in general, you'll see progress. You'll see progress. So uh, the uh, Hezbollah, uh, it's, it believes that history is on its side. And like the secular communist movement, willing to give their lives, willing to give their lives for their cause, for their ideology whatever you want to call it. And that's not true of Israelis anymore. It's just not. If you were to ask me, 
What caused that intelligence failure on October 7th, that catastrophic, colossal, disastrous uh, intelligence failure? You know what my answer would be? I know you're not going to, you'll, you'll think I'm being facetious. I'm absolutely not. I see young people. I see young people. Young people cannot last for 30 seconds without looking at their iPhones, mm -hmm. without being on their social media. I think those guys half the time are like this, because I see it with the young people. They're supposed to be doing intelligence, but they're in front of a computer. Well, what do you think they're doing if they're in front of a computer? Like this. The other side is not like that. I know. I've met them. I've met them. There is a determination, a tenacity, a focus that is, dare I say, terrifying. So when Chaim Levinson said, in fact, we're a very mediocre army, it's not the question of the technology. Obviously, they have a cutting-edge technology. Of that, there can be no doubt. They're no longer a fighting force. They're a murder force from the air. They can commit the side that swallows absolutely correct. They're quite effective at committing massacres. But in the conventional sense of what it means to be an army, you know, combat, ground troops. No. And I don't fault them. You know, I don't, uh, I don't, I'm not, I, I'm not that kind of person. Would I want to give my life for a cause? I wish I find the strength if and when the moment of truth comes. But I cannot say I'm confident. But I met the people in Hezbollah, the fighters, because I toured the South once. Oh, no, there was no question. There was no question. That's why Israel never wants to tangle with the party of God. It's not a joke. So, um, the uh, Israelis now, I'm not happy to say it, I'm not gleeful, but they reveal to the world, uh, writ large, but to elements within the Arab world in particular, that a military option is available. I'll just give you one last anecdote. Uh, there was a famous battle fought between Hezbollah and Israel. I think it was a 2006 war. You can check it. It's Bint, B-I-N-T, Jabil, J-B-E-I-L, Bint Jabil. I think it was 2006. And after that battle, Nasrallah, Saeed Nasrallah, the head of the Hezbollah, he gave a famous speech. And he said about Bin Chabil, he said, it shows that Israel is a spider's web. And they said, he just blow on it. And it disappears. After October 7th, he gave another speech. And he said, uh, Said this was extremely smart guy, very focused. He's like a Muslim version of Lenin, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Yes, he is. Uh -huh. And he said, I don't want to brag, I don't want to boast, I don't want to gloat. But he said, I said before, Israel was a spider's web. And he said, October 7th showed to many people that I was right. And that was the message that was transmitted by October 7th. And so now Israel has a colossal task in its mind. Its task is it has to restore that 
deterrence capacity, which is just the Israeli term for the Arab world's fear of us. And now that means undoing the message that was transmitted by that colossal failure on October 7th. And they don't know what to do. First, they said they were going to destroy Hezbollah. Then they said, we're going to target its leaders. We can get those three leaders, Sinwar, DF, and there's a third one. Dief, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name. And there's a third one. But they can, they're unsuccessful at anything. So, uh, they fear, unfortunately, I think there's some truth to it, that they don't know how to restore their deterrence capacity anymore. Because they revealed, you're much too young to remember, but during the 1970s, Mao Zedong, uh, when he was a revolutionary, he would describe, he would say, during the Vietnam War, he said, the United States is a paper tiger. That was the famous expression. Your listeners can Google that too. Mao Zedong, U.S. paper tiger, by which he meant it can take big bites, can cause a lot of damage, but at the end of the day, it's like the spider's web, you know. And uh, they have, that's Israel's dilemma right now. Um. And the third aspect is there is the bloodlust and the sheer fury that these untermenschen had raised their heads. There is the deterrence capacity. And um, there's also, you know, the cliche, wherever there's a crisis, there's an opportunity. And Israel feels now it has an opportunity just like in 48, which brings us full circle, it has the opportunity to uh, get rid of that thorn at its site, which is why people now, as you know, in a lot of talk about this is the new Nakba. This is the yeah. new Nakba, meaning the explosion in 48. Yes, I think that's correct in the sense that Israel sees the same possibility. It, see, it saw in October 7th, a crisis, a trauma, I'm not going to dispute that, but also the opportunity to rid itself of that thorn at its side, namely uh, Gaza. The fact of the matter is, time doesn't allow us, won't allow us, I don't think. Um, there were ways to resolve this. Uh, Hamas was amenable to a settlement on the basis of international law and UN resolutions. It was amenable to the Arab Peace Initiative, which I mentioned earlier, of 2002, uh, Israel just doesn't accept those terms. Israel will not accept a settlement among equals on the basis of international law. It won't. It didn't have to come to this. It's a complete, I, I'd have to say it's a complete disaster now. It's a... Very, very bad in sorrow. It's only going to move in a worse direction. It's not going to get better. Israel will now use this opportunity because there's a new problem. The new problem is it's lost its deterrence capacity on the northern, uh, in the northern front with Hezbollah. Because Hezbollah trying to support Gaza as it should, in my opinion, um, has been killing Israeli soldiers, firing on Israel. And so now Israel feels that's another blow to its deterrence capacity. They're attacking Israel on the northern front. So what's the only answer to that? The only answer is to go in and level Lebanon. Because they're not going to fight the party of God. That's impossible. If you see the size of those rallies when Nasrallah speaks, no, they're not going to fight the party of God. But they'll go in and do to Lebanon. 
And I kind of think that's an inevitability now because their deterrence capacity has been undermined in a double sense. First, it's, it's um, comprehensive weakness revealed by October 7th. And then it's, so to speak, local weakness, namely against Hezbollah in the north. And so it has to attack Hezbollah. Uh, and you could imagine, I don't have to go all the way to Iran, you know, the last dot, connect the last dot. It's a total catastrophe what's happening now. Total catastrophe. Because I do believe, I, sorry, I'm saying it, but I have to speak the truth. I do believe that Nasrallah probably thinks now is the time we can get rid of Israel. No. I do believe that's a real problem. I can't deny that. I don't think it's their fault. I think Israel caused the whole situation. All those pro-Israel people who created this situation. They created it. It could have been bizarre. But they felt they felt that the, the the Arabs, in particular the Palestinians in Gaza, that they would just I'm see I'm very, I'm being very literal here. They thought they would go the way of the Native Americans, put them on the reservation, in this case a concentration camp, and just leave them there to languish and die. They really thought that would work. You want to hear something? I thought that would work. That's why I gave up in 2020. I stopped writing about it. I thought they had won. Israel had won. It was over. You know, I was uh, shocked by October 7. And uh, and I don't know how it will end, but I don't think I don't think it's anywhere near over. And I think we could be headed towards a point where hey, I'm 70, you're a young man, where it could become terminal for humanity. Now, Israel does have a very generous stock of nuclear weapons. And Hezbollah has a very generous stock of missiles and rockets. And that's what, I don't have to explain that to you. If you're in Stanford, you can figure out that that's a lethal combination on both sides of the border. And many people, including Benny Morris, who he mentioned earlier, uh, Benny Morris is very eager for an attack on Iran now. Well, he's always been eager for an attack on Iran because he's a maniac, like most Israelis. I'm sorry, but they are the maniacs. Uh, uh, he's, uh, since 2008, he's been pushing for an attack on Iran. And now he's starting up again with his... Uh, let's attack Iran. He just had a long article on this. I don't know the modern stuff. Quillette. It's called Q U I L L E. He had a long article. What was the bottom line? Got to attack Iran. You're yeah, sure, Benny. You want to attack Iran? You know what, Benny? I'll give you a cat pistol. I'll give you an air rifle. Or you can go somewhere in our Midwest or South and get, get yourself an AK 47. And you go attack Iran. But you know what? Leave me out of it. You're a maniac. You want to mess with Iran? You know? You did such a fine job in Gaza, which is only 2.3 million people, half of them children. You think you did such a great job in Gaza that now you want to go after Iran? Go ahead. But you know what? Leave the rest of the world out of it. Yeah, that, that's how I feel. You're crazy. It's a lunatic state. I'm not saying it was intrinsically lunatic. I'm not saying it was lunatic in its DNA. I think that most states, if you go back, you trace back their history, it's not a pretty picture. Yeah. Our founding fathers were Indian killers. You know, George Washington, his nickname among the Iroquois was Town Destroyer. Not a pretty picture. You look at our Declaration of Independence and it attacks the British for supporting the savages, Native Americans. Not a pretty picture. And then there's a other whole story called slavery. Well, uh, what countries can evolve. I don't think anything is set in stone. 
but Israel for very from for many reasons it evolved into a completely lunatic state. Totally. And, and uh I think it created a real problem for itself, but it created a real problem for all of us. If this thing escalates, and frankly, I have to be honest, I can't see how it won't escalate. Nasrallah laid down the red line. The red line was, we, uh, we will not accept a Hamas defeat. If it looks like Hamas is going to be militarily defeated, we will be in mouth. So, and I think he's, uh, say what you want about him, he is a person of his word. And there's also another point. It's for his survival as an organization. A, if he doesn't come to the aid of Hamas, he's, uh, Hezbollah is completely discredited because Hezbollah's whole clan has been all the Arab states just talk, but we do the walk. We also do. But if they let, if they let Hamas expire, then they lose all their credibility. But there's a second issue. Of course, after Hamas is defeated, Hezbollah will be next. That's just, just absolutely obvious. So he can't let them go down on defeat. Because the next step to restore their deterrence capacity is to flock in Lebanon. We're in a very tough situation. It's easy to talk here. But, you know, I, I, I go through it in my mind today. I went for a very long walk. And I just started to think it through. Think it through. Okay, how can we get out of this impasse? How can we break free of this impasse? So I thought to myself, okay, we need an international conference. And then who's going to convene it? It's going to convene it. The Americans aren't going to convene it. The Europeans are going to convene it. So then you think about the BRICS plus, maybe they will convene it. Now, some conference to try to restore some sanity in a situation which is going in a terminal direction. But I, I couldn't figure it out. You know, you're supposed to at the end, uh, I was on. Uh, I don't know, what's your field of study? Philosophy. Uh, well, I was a, 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 a protege of um, Paul Sweezy, um, the great American Marxist economist, and he edited this journal called Monthly Review. And he was a brilliant guy, but every article always had to end up on a positive note. That the forces of history are on our side, da, da, da. And so when I write, I want to end on some positive note of what can be done, you know, to avert the catastrophe. But I, I really can't see it right now. I'm really very pessimistic. And I don't know what to, well, what to do right now. It's a complete disaster. It was a disaster. It didn't have to happen. If you look at the historical record, and I know that record very well. It was a disaster that didn't have to happen. But you know the expression of having gone beyond the point of no return. And I'm not sure we haven't gone beyond the point of no return. So, very sobering. Well, let me uh, just say a few things. First of all, uh, that was phenomenal, Norman. I, I was hanging on every word. There are, I mean, time doesn't permit. I could probably respond for 20 minutes and then you could talk for another three hours and it would be very fascinating, but I'll just limit myself to one comment. And I found the analogy of Gaza to a concentration camp and how it forms the people who are born and who die there very compelling. And there's a lot more there to discuss. Yesterday, I was speaking with this professor here that I, I've already mentioned. And he was saying something similar, but not with the same analogy. He said that when he was a, a boy, 
he knew kids who would beat dogs to a pulp. That was his how he put it, and I kind of just shuddered to hear it. But then when he would try to take care of these dogs, even if they had been kind dogs beforehand, they would lash out at him, bite him, try to scratch, do whatever they could to keep him uh, from getting at them. And it's, it's a very similar, it's not the same analogy, but it's very similar to what you were saying. And I'm not necessarily trying to play devil's advocate, but I'm trying to understand how you feel about the other side. Something that a quote I heard a long time ago, a uh, year, so I'm not going to have it right, is that some Israeli general said something to the effect of the last time we didn't fight back and they took us to the concentration camps, to the gas chambers. This time, if they so much as step on our toes, we'll take their heads. And I found this, I could be fabricating this, maybe nobody ever said this, but the idea remains, it's very powerful in, I think, the the Jewish zeitgeist, that they were in concentration camps as well. And they there was an attempt to exterminate them. They have been uh, discriminated against uh, from time immemorial, not to use, I'm not quoting it in the, in that, in the context of that book. But I'm wondering if you see it as, you see the response from the Israeli side as understandable given this broader context in the same way that you find the Hamas response understandable given that they have been uh, born and raised in Gaza? Um, after, uh, some people are of the opinion that because uh, you, you have a common experience, you draw the same conclusions. Different people draw different conclusions from the exact same experience. There are people who came out of the concentration camps who reached the conclusion, never again for Jews. And uh, as I said, after 47, after the war, and come 1947, they're going to do what it takes to create a state, come what may, whoever gets in our way. You know, they were absolutely ruthless and they expelled the indigenous population. 90% of the Arab population of the state that became Israel was expelled. And their, their own land flattened to be rebuilt, but for a new population. Now, there are others who came out of the experience who said never again to anybody not just never again to Jews. Now, my parents fell into the second category. They had an absolutely horrible marriage. I used to call the marriage made in hell. Horrible marriage. However, my mother once said to me, you know, Norman, for all the fights with your father and for however horrible that marriage were, was, we never disagreed about politics. So I mentioned that because I was talking to my brother the other day. I had been on Pierce Morgan, uh, his program. And he asked me, what do you think my parents would have thought of what I was saying, what I was saying about Israel and Gaza? And I gave my opinion. I said, I think my parents would have been on the side of the people in the concentration camp, the people of Gaza. But of course, I said on the show, if you watched it, I said, it's pure speculation. I can't prove that. So then I called up my brother. Because I, I do care about accurately rendering my parents' memory. I don't want to appropriate it as my own. It's in theirs, and I want to accurately represent who they were, not who I am. So I asked my brother, what do you think mom and dad would have said about what's happening in Gaza? And my brother said, mom, she would have been screaming out the window, Nazis, 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 Nazis. 
And then they said, my father, who's more subdued, he would not have liked what was happening. He would not have liked it. It's true, my father was non-confrontational. My mother was very confrontational. So when you talk to me about the Israeli response, I would say that's the response of some Jews. But Jews like my parents? No. Impossible. So, that's my answer. My, my, my parents would have called them Nazis for what they're doing to those. There is, you know, you don't want to make comparisons. It's very hard to make comparisons. But the closest analog to what has been done to the people of God, so when you've read the history, the closest analog is what happened to the Native Americans. I once wrote a long article on the Cherokee comparing the situation of the Palestinians. If you know the story of the Cherokee, they start out in the Northeast and they're pushed and they're pushed and they're pushed. And then there's a trail of tears and they're pushed from, I think, Mississippi and North Carolina to Arkansas. And then in Arkansas, they're pushed again and they're put in this small place the settlers come in to overwhelm them numerically, and then the state of Oklahoma is created. And once they were numerically overwhelmed, pushed and pushed and pushed, then the Trail of Tears, and then, Oklahoma, then Arkansas, then Oklahoma. And that's the story of the people of Gaza, except with one difference. The people of Gaza haven't been on the receiving end of what Israel likes to call mowings of the lawn. That's periodically these high-tech massacres in order to cut the blades of grass, one half of which, one half of those 2.3 million blades of grass one half are children. And now Israel is resolved on extirpating those blades of grass, whether it will be an expulsion, whether it be an extermination, whether it will be something in between, we still don't know. So when you read that ghastly history, so, so yes. It's very hard to get inside and feel some sympathy for the Israelis. Sorry. Uh, maybe it's a failure of imagination on my part, but at the risk of playing what's sometimes called the Holocaust, Holocaust card, I will say, and in, that, in this case, the apple did not fall, fall far from the tree, meaning who I am and who my parents were. Every single member on both sides of my family was exterminated during World War II. I never had an aunt. I never had an uncle. I never had a cousin. I never had a grandparent. We were five people in the world, my mother, my father, and my two siblings and myself. And my parents saw the worst. We were in the Warsaw Ghetto, both of them, though they didn't know each other. They then were in the, the combination death camp, concentration camp. And Majdanek and Auschwitz were concentration camps and death camps. My mother was in Majdanek. She was then deported to two slave labor camps. And my father was, according to my mother, I never talked about with him. She said he was in seven concentration camps. He ended up in Auschwitz, and then he was in the Auschwitz death march. Uh, they still can't, they, they were not perfect. I'm a lot less perfect. But they were not perfect. But they came out decent human beings. At least when they saw suffering, 
they didn't see it as an opportunity to cut somebody's head. So I have very little sympathy for what has become of that state. It's a, it's a satanic state. You know, you look at the polls, 60% of Israelis, 60% say Israel's not using enough force in Gaza. It's not using enough force in Gaza. If you look at every metric out there, every metric, intensity of bombing, payload of bombs, imprecision of bombs, destruction of civilian infrastructure, ratio of civilians to combatants killed, ratio of children to total numbers killed, ratio of women and children to total numbers killed. If you look at every metric, there have been so many studies now done. What Israel is doing in Gaza is in the class completely its own. You know it doesn't even compare. It doesn't even compare. It doesn't even compare remotely to the carpet bombing of German cities during World War II, the Allied carpet bombing of German cities, the Allied bombing of Dresden. It doesn't compare. And in the face of that, to say 60% are saying you haven't killed enough, you haven't destroyed enough, you lose me. As I said, you know the expression, the, uh, there was um, a uh, block on Harry Truman's desk, the president Harry Truman, the buck stops here. And my imagination, my moral imagination stops there. I'm not going further. I'm not going to try to see the side of that. And I'll admit to you, I won't see the side of uh, people who say, you know, I, get into, I got into a disagreement with Dr. Cornell West. Um, I don't see the other side. I don't see the concentration camp guard side. I told Dr. West, you're not going to get me to call them brother and sister. It's not going to happen. I have limits on my moral imagination. And uh, just, as my, just as calling a concentration camp guard brother or sister, as I told uh, Dr. West, is a sacrilege on the dead, in my opinion. I am not going to say I can understand where the Israelis are coming from. I won't go there. No. Killing 8,000 children in two months? The total, do you know that is more children killed than every single combat zone? for the years 2020, 2021, and 2022 combined. Combined. More children killed. Now, who are they killing? They're killing people in a concentration camp. They're killing people in a concentration They can't go anywhere. They can't flee. Uh, but now it's, uh, I have to admit, I'm going to be honest, it's now a horror all around. We're heading in a place where I at least, uh, you know, the, Sarge, the play by Jean-Paul Sartre, No Exit. I don't see an exit. I don't. Sorry if I have to end on such a depressing note, but. I, I, I try to treat adults as adults. I'm not going to be a bearer. I'm not going to be a bearer of happy news. I think this is a, a genuine catastrophe, not a human catastrophe in the first place, but it can turn into a political catastrophe of dimensions which none of us want to imagine. And I would be very happy, really, this is one of those situations where I would be very happy to be proven wrong.
you know, or for somebody to tell me, no, there is responsibility. Fine, I will. Gra I will grasp it, but I don't see it right now. I just don't see it. Well, uh, Norman, this has been uh, an absolutely terrific episode. Uh, thank you so, so, so much for joining me and, and taking the time to have this conversation. 